Hello, my name is Michael Brown. I'm often asked about my techniques for creating three-dimensional photographs using the lenticular process. And I put together this short presentation that I help, hope might guide other enthusiasts on how they can create 3D lenticular images. The goal of this presentation is to teach you about the workflow involved, uh, equipment and supplies you might need, uh, techniques for image processing, printing, finishing, and displaying lenticular photographs. A bit about me, I'm an independent artist. I work out of a home-based studio in Antioch, Illinois, which is outside of Chicago. Uh, my artistic medium is lenticular printmaking, and I make such prints from my original photography. I create both a kinetic, that is changing lenticular prints, as well as 3D lenticular prints. The focus on this presentation is on 3D photography. So why do I use lenticular? Because lenticular prints are so easy to share with the general public. Unlike stereo pairs that require a stereoscope or some other device to view, you know, perhaps a 3D TV, I can hand someone a lenticular print and if they have normal binocular vision, they're able to look at it and sense all the depth. So there's none of the eye gymnastics you need with free viewing of stereo pairs, you don't need stereoscopes, you need none of those things. The lenticular prints are so easy to share and I can exhibit them at my outdoor art shows or in galleries. They hang on the wall just like traditional photographs. They don't require any special lighting or electricity like you often need to display 3D imagery with uh, the holographic process or with parallax barriers. So in essence, the 3D lenticulars, they're uh, fun to view and they're easy to share. Uh, the lenticular process does have some limitations compared to traditional photography. Uh, to begin with, it's, it's lower resolution. Um, and the amount of depth you can get out of a 3D lenticular is also limited. It's certainly greater than a standard photograph, which is two-dimensional and, and flat by nature. But the depth effect isn't as great as you might get if you're looking through a stereo pair, excuse me, if you're looking at a stereo pair through a stereoscope. The amount of depth you get with the lenticular falls somewhere between those two extremes. I like to imagine the, the aspect ratio or shape of a, a cereal box. So you have the box that has a certain width and a certain height. And when you look at the depth of that box, you know, the cereal box is probably, you know, two inches deep. Um, and it's not a, not a foot depth. So the lenticular process lends itself to 3D pictures that have a limited depth budget. Um, Lenticular lenses, by their nature, are made of plastic, at least the ones that are readily available. And these ribbed lenses um, can be highly reflective, so you don't necessarily want to hang a lenticular print opposite a window. And they're also somewhat soft. The lenticular surface is not as hard as a, a piece of glass. So, for example, if I had a lenticular print and I took a, a car key out of my wallet and scratch the front of the print, you know, you would you would damage it. So under normal environmental conditions inside a home or office, the lenticular is just fine, but if you don't exercise care, you know, you, you could scratch the surface of the print. So those were the primary limitations of the lenticular, but the, the benefits are just fantastic. Now, lenticular prints come in a variety of forms. There are prints that animate, so as you you know, rotate a print or walk by, it might flip from one scene to another, there could be a zooming effect or a, a morphing effect. Uh, such prints are usually made with the lenticules oriented horizontally, and you would have this little card held in your hand and you would rotate it up and down and you would see the flip effect or the zoom effect or the morph effect. Three lenticulars are a little different for the three-dimensional application. You want the lenticules oriented vertically. Oops, excuse me. So some characteristics of a 3D lenticular print, the depth appears both in front of and behind the lenticular sheet. The image detail is sharpest right at the surface of the sheet, excuse me, sheet, <laughs> and the depth will come off the sheet about one to two inches and appear to be behind the surface of the sheet about one to two inches. So the best photographs made with uh, the lenticular te technique are those that have sort of a cinematic style with uh, selective focus. Uh, so your subject might be in focus, but something in the immediate foreground might be a little soft, and in the background might be soft, 
and uh, those type of compositions work very well with 3D lenticular. In most cases, when you make a 3D lenticular print, you'll view it straight on, and as you rotate in the hand from side to side, you might see a flash where the, the frames reset. That's just the nature of the beast. So the basic workflow for making 3D lenticulars are to obtain a set of frames, which you can take with a camera or make with a computer. You do some image processing to those frames. You then interlace the frames, combining multiple frames into one single image that can be printed. And you take that print and bond a lenticular sheet to it, and then do some finishing and they are all ready to display. So let's talk a little bit about equipment and supplies. Most digital photographers are pretty close to having everything they need to make a lenticular picture. Uh, you need some sort of input device, which could be a digital camera or a scanner if you're using film, a computer with software to do some image processing, and then an output device, which would be a printer. The thing most photographers don't currently have are the lenticular sheets themselves and a laminator to bond the sheets to the print. So those are two things that would have to be acquired. So cameras or scanners allow you to obtain uh, 2D or 3D photography and convert it into lenticular prints. Uh, there's another approach which is to use multi-frame photographic techniques. Uh, that could be acquiring images using a camera that takes a burst of pictures or even using a, a video camera. Of course, video is a, a sequence of frames. When we look at this illustration, you can see on the Upper left is a classic stereo pair. Uh, below it is a realist slide made with, uh, you know, a stereo realist type camera. I don't know if that was the exact model. And again, you have uh, two images, which would be meant to be viewed by the left and right eye. On the upper right is a camera on a video slider, and the slider is the horizontal device. It's mounted to a tripod. And using that slider, I can basically move the camera from one side to the other, thereby capturing a series of pictures, each with a different horizontal perspective. And the bottom right is actually an array of five digital point-and-shoot cameras. And they're wired so they can be uh, fired simultaneously, or what we refer to as in synchronization. And that allows you to capture multiple horizontal viewpoints of uh, subjects in motion. So the next thing to talk about are computers and software. Almost any modern computer will be just fine for making lenticular pictures. Uh, you'll need an image editor, something like Adobe Photoshop or equivalent, uh, interlacing software, and that software is what does the magic of combining multiple pictures into one view. And then there's uh, optional software, but software that's useful to have. Thing, software like Stereo Photo Maker, uh, perhaps tri Stereo Tracer, which we'll talk about in a moment, and Adobe After Effects software. Interlacing software comes in both free versions and commercial versions. My recommendation is to buy modern commercial software. But I've listed these all out on the screen. I would advise you to put Google to good advantage and look up these different programs. Some are for the Mac, some are for the PC, Others are for both. I'm often asked, what do I use? Uh, although for many years I was using the Power Illusion software, uh, most recently, the past year or so, I've been using the one listed at the very bottom, which is called Lentigram. But from time to time, I'll use others like uh, the 3D Master Kit. And um, when I very first started, I was using 3D Easy Space. So depending on what I'm trying to achieve, depending on what computer I'm working on, you know, I'll select one of these programs. But again, currently I'm on a Macintosh and I'm using the Lentigram software. So other useful software. Well, I couldn't get by without Adobe Photoshop and its camera raw capability. Photoshop allows me to do all my color correction, cropping, uh, modifying exposure, shadow detail, all, all those things. So that's, for me, a must have. Uh, other software uses Stereo Photo Maker, which interestingly enough is a PC program. There is no Mac equivalent. So I use a emulator program called Parallels, which allows me to run PC software on my Macintosh. 
uh, Stereo Photo Maker is good for working with stereo pairs. It also allows you to do multi-image functions, which are helpful with lenticular printmaking. And it has a fairly new capability in which you can open a stereo pair and create a depth map from that stereo pair. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, Adobe After Effects, I also would not want to live without. It has a lot of features that are very handy for working with multiple frame imagery, whether that's video or a series of still pictures. It has the ability to do some pixel motion tracking, which allows me to create in-between frames from a frame series. So uh, a highly valued piece of software. Uh, Triaxis Stereo Tracer is really good for photographers who are shooting stereo pairs and they want to make lenticular prints. It allows for a workflow that creates a depth map and a frame series from stereo pairs. So if you have a Fuji W1 or W3 or some stereo realist slides that you want to scan and make into lenticular prints, you probably want to explore that program. And the last item listed is actually a blog that's put out by a researcher and enthusiast on 3D stereo photography. And he offers all sorts of command line interface software for creating depth maps from stereo pairs. And in fact, one of his software elements has been incorporated into Stereo Photo Maker to do the depth map creation I talked about earlier. But talking about depth maps, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so let's just continue on. To make the pictures, you want to have a photo quality inkjet printer. And there are great models from both Epson and Canon. And in fact, when I surveyed the members of my lenticular special interest group, most recently, almost everyone is using either an Epson or Canon photo quality inkjet printer to produce their lenticulars. Uh, these printers have uh, print head drivers that have either 720 or 600 pixel per inch resolution which is a topic that always confuses people because they, they read the box or the spec sheets for these printers and the printers mention they have extremely high quality, you know, 2880 dots per inch or, you know, 5,000 something dots per inch. Well, dots and pixels are not the same thing and just because you have a lot of dots doesn't mean you can re resolve uh, high frequency detail. So you have to really ignore the high advertised values and understand what your printer can really achieve. Uh, here's some screenshots. The left column are digital files I sent to the printer from Photoshop. Basically a series of black stripes alternating with the white paper base. On the right column are actual microscopic views of how that printed output appeared. So first of all, you can see in all cases I was sending just black stripes, but if you look at the magnified views, you find out, oh, there's all these colored little droplets of ink in there. So even when you're printing just black, color inks are used. And secondly, you can look at these resolutions, the bottom pair, 180 pixels per inch, the middle pair, 360 pixels per inch, and you can still clearly resolve those lines with uh, white stripes in between the lines. But the top pair, 720 pixels per inch, no, you can't really resolve. It's just a a jumbled mess of ink droplets. So again, even though your printer says it's exceedingly high resolution on the spec sheet, those are dots per inch and uh, those dots are used in a screening process to take the continuous tone image from your digital file and make it into a screened print. So remember values like 360 pixels per inch because those will be important later. So printer accuracy, it would be nice if we could command the printer to put down a single pixel and that pixel would appear on the finished print, but it doesn't really work that way. There's a lot of dithering that occurs with these printers and there are satellite drops that land in places they shouldn't land. So here's another microscopic comparison. On the left top, you can see the column of pixels I sent to the printer. And then just below that, you can see a ADX magnification of what the printer actually produced on the piece of film and you can see a, a few things like there are gaps in the yellow, the magenta is composed of both magenta dots and blue dots, you know there's some contamination in the reds, the greens and blues and so forth. When we look at the right hand side of this screen 
it's cleaned up a little bit. I used a find edges filter so you can more clearly see what the printer is producing. So you can see, for example, that the yellow stripe actually is fairly, well, there, there are gaps in it, certainly, but it's, it's fairly narrow. But you look at the, the red and look how much wider it is than the uh, pixel column that was sent to it. So there's, you know, significant dot gain in all of this, which it, again, sort of cuts down on the, the resolution that the printers are able to produce. So we've talked about printers. Now you have to feed your printer with something and the best thing to put in it is white polyester film. The film is dimensionally stable, doesn't have a lot of dot gain, and it bonds very well to the lenticular sheets. Uh, the second choice would be a glossy photo paper. It works almost as well, but not quite. Uh, the problem with the paper is typically when you're bonding it to the lens, you get sort of a silvering effect, which is hard to describe, but it's these little microscopic little white particles or snowflakes that you'll see at certain angles on the print. And that, that photo paper just doesn't bond as cleanly as the white film does. If you look at the picture here on the screen, you can see uh, three packs of letter size media. The left is ink press, white gloss film, highly recommended. The center is Pictorico Pro, that's what I'm currently using. And then the third is the Epson Glossy. So if you can't get either of the film products, you can get this glossy paper product. So let's talk a little bit about lenticular sheets. These are some nice uh, macro cross sections of the sheets. You can see the round ribs on top. That's actually the, the surface of the lens. The thickness of the lens is actually the focal length. And the idea is that these uh, ribs or lenticules will focus down just on a, a thin column of pixels that are printed on the paper. So there are two types of lenticular sheets. There are wide angle and narrow angle. And the narrow angle sheets typically have a viewing angle of about 25 degrees and they're used for 3D imagery. The animation lenses have a wider viewing angle, typically twice the viewing angle of the 3D sheets. And those are generally used for the animated pieces, you know, that flip or morph and so on. The lenticular sheets have a certain pitch or resolution. You can have uh, sheets with as coarse a pitch as 15 lenticules per inch and as high a pitch as 100 lenticules per inch. And of course, there are the occasional outliers that are either coarser or finer in resolution, but these are the common values. Now for inkjet printed lenticules or lenticular prints, you generally won't use something even as high as 100. Most of the work is produced on 20, 40, or 60 LPI lenticule per inch lenses. And to start off, I would just suggest working with the 40 LPI lens. In the United States, there's a company called MicroLens Technology in North Carolina. They uh, produce and sell these lenses. Uh, you can buy these lens uh, either pre-coated with a pressure sensitive adhesive or without the adhesive. If you don't have the ability or knowledge to coat your own, you probably want to buy those lenses with adhesive. Uh, again, for 3D prints, the lenses should be run vertically. Uh, two lens types I would suggest starting with would be the 810 3D60. 810 means 8 by 10 inches. 3D means it's a narrow viewing angle. 60 means it's 60 lenticules per inch. So that's the lens I use. Mm -hmm. Having said that, that uh, 60 part would be optional. If you're just starting out, you probably want to get the 810 3D40. But once you're comfortable, you know, lining up the lenses to the sheet and bonding them in place, I, I would, my second recommendation would be to move on to the 60. If you're making more poster size prints, they have a 16 by 20 3D 40. Again, order that with adhesive. You can uh, Google microlens technology or call them on the phone to get more details on the lens. The pictures on the right are basically showing you uh, cross sections of the two types of lenses. The 3D lens with the 24 degree ang viewing angle and the animation lens with the 49 degree viewing angle. Ah, then a laminator. A laminator lets you bond your print to the lenticular sheet as I'm doing in this illustration, making an eight by 10 photo. Uh, laminator, laminators typically come in hot or cold models. You want a cold laminator. The hot laminators would heat up those rollers which are nice for laminating documents, but for the lenticular workflow could actually distort your, your print or your lens. So you want to run those laminators in the cold mode. All right, so we have some of the hardware out of the way. Let's talk about 
some of the workflow. First thing we have to do is get a series of frames. So if you look at the very bottom of this illustration, you can see pictures I took my daughter years ago, and each one of those individual pictures has a slightly different horizontal perspective. So we take multiple frames from different horizontal points, interlace them, and create our lenticular print. Typically, between 6 and 36 frames are used to make a 3D lenticular. There is no magic number. Some people say, oh, I should have 8 cameras, I should have 12, I should have 36 frames, you know. All of those values will work. See there, uh, there's always a quest to obtain the magic number, and I'm convinced after you know, 15 years of doing this, there is no magic number. But we'll talk about what some of the differences are when you use more or fewer frames. So to obtain a frame set, you, know, you could use a camera and create a traditional uh, photography, or you could start off with some imagery you already have. There's a way of converting regular flat 2D pictures into 3D. There's a way of converting stereo pairs into 3D. I refer to that as a 3D to 3D conversion. Or you can take a video camera or a uh, digital camera running in burst mode and take a series of stills. So you can either work with existing imagery or take new imagery. So now touching on that magic number, how many frames to use, there is a often quoted formula. I'll throw it out here. I have to concede I'm not a huge believer in it, but for people who want a place to start, they can do this. You first figure out how many uh, lenticles per inch you have, and again, I often recommend 40 LPI lens. Then you figure out what your printer driver resolution is, and I have them listed here for both uh, Epson and Canon, and you pretty much divide the printer resolution by the lens pitch, and that gives you an optimum number of frames. So. If your printer truly could print 720 pixels per inch for a 40 LPI lenticular sheet, you would use 18 frames. But as we've discussed earlier, your printer really can't produce <laughs> 720 pixels per inch. So if you're looking for a magic number, use this formula. But again, if you have more frames or fewer frames, it probably won't matter all that much. When you use fewer frames, uh, there's more depth, but there's something called print jitter. There's always crosstalk with a lenticular picture, and to get the sharpest, deepest lenticular pictures, you generally use fewer frames. To get the smoothest lenticular pictures, so you don't have any of this jitter as you're rotating in your hand or, or walking by it, you use more frames. You try to out-resolve both the printer and the lens. So fewer frames, better depth and sharpness, more frames, a smoother, cleaner looking print. So there are some recommendations for the number of frames to use with Epson or Canon or HP printers. All right, so let's talk about some techniques. And again, we can either use existing photography and do conversions, or we can use cameras and create a frame series. And we can do that with you know a single camera with its sole lens, or we can use a special lenticular camera, which would be a multi-lens camera, or we could fire multiple lenses, excuse me, multiple cameras and synchronization with each other. So there's cases and applications for all those things. So let's talk about the case where you have a flat 2D photograph and you want to make a 3D lenticular print. This is one I worked on a few years ago. It's a photograph of the English author G.K. Chesterton and his wife and their dog. And on the right, you see a somewhat unusual image and this image is a depth map. And the way this depth map is set up, the elements of the scene that are far away are dark in tone, and the closer the elements are to the viewer or the camera's perspective, the lighter they are in tone. So you can see that the uh, two people are lighter than the background, and the bushes in front of them are lighter than they are. So these depth maps typically have 256 uh, tones going from white to black. And in some cases, white represents the most forward element and black represents the rearmost element. And in other cases, it's just reversed. And you just have to figure out <laughs> which depth map you have when you're, you're rendering your imagery, which is, is not really hard to do. 
So let's talk about this in a little more detail. Uh, these depth maps can be generated by software. So if you have a stereo photograph, you can use a software like Stereo Photo Maker or Triaxis um, software, and they will ingest your stereo pair and output a depth map. This depth map we're looking at is actually pretty clean. It's a hand-drawn depth map, and it was produced by this company. You can see the bottom right, depthmask.com, a fellow named Zaza, and he produces excellent depth maps. It's a real neat uh, capability we have because I live in the Chicago area and I have no idea where Zaza actually lives. It's somewhere on the other side of the world. But using email, I can send him my picture and I can pay him via PayPal. And the next day, I have a beautiful depth map to work with that he has created. So I don't feel I personally have the skill to make great depth maps. So I'm happy that there's a, a service like that. So anyway, these depth maps can be uh, software generated or they can be, be produced by hand. So I used software on this project called Triaxis Stereo Tracer Pro. It allowed me to take the photograph, take the depth map, put them together, and then it generated 36 frames, each frame with a unique horizontal perspective, and I was able to interlace the frame series and make the lenticular print, and I have to say Everyone who has seen it, who is a fan of Chesterton, thinks that print is just pretty fantastic. Now, I'm going to show you a little simulation here. This was actually uh, done in software called Power Illusion, which is a software I think I started in 2017, and I used that until 2019. But it had a real neat ability to allow you to preview the depth of your lenticular picture. And I wish more modern software, you know, you know, supported capability. Kudos to uh, Juan Raymer who developed this software. All right, let's talk about conversion two. You have a stereo pair. It could be uh, two images made using the cha-cha technique, made using a vintage stereo camera like the realist pictured here, or a Fuji W1 or W3. So again, Triaxis Stereo Tracer Pro will allow you to take the stereo pair, it will generate a depth map, and the depth map can generate a series of frames. Now, a fairly recent development, you know, the, the past year or so, a Stereo Photo Maker can do this similar process to generate a depth map and a series of frames. Not as intuitive and easy to use as the Triaxis software, but I have to admit Stereo Photo Maker is free software and it's pretty cool that it can do it at all. All right, so 3D to 3D conversion, another example of that, but in this case, I had the stereo pair from the Fuji camera. I use uh, depthmask.com, Zaza made me the depth map, and I use Stereo Tracer Pro to generate the frame series and make the lenticular print. Now, fairly new to the world of, of 3D lenticular is the ability to use camera phones. Uh, camera phones now, many of them, and more and more of them every day, are allowing you to uh, create uh, depth maps. Uh, they do it for different reasons than what we're doing it for. Uh, the manufacturers are trying to emulate the look of a digital SR with selective focus, where your subject's in focus but the background is blurred. And as part of their image processing routine, they do that out of focus effect using a depth map. But for our purposes, this is terrific that you can use a camera and take a photograph and get a depth map kind of automatically with your picture. Uh, some of the phones uh, use uh, the multiple lenses on the phone. Like I know my, my current iPhone actually has three little lenses on it, but there's new... Uh, Oh, I guess I have to learn how to spell learning right. There's new uh, AI machine learning techniques that actually can come up with these depth maps even from a, a single lens camera, which is pretty cool. Now coming out this year or next year are time of flight uh, sensors in the cameras and those will allow uh, even better depth maps to be created. Right now with the two lens approach, you can get a pretty good depth map for near scene you know, let's say something where your subject is maybe six feet away, these time of flight sensor 
arrangements should be able to produce depth maps that are pretty clear out to like 15 or 20 feet. So I'm looking forward to that capability becoming more common. All right, technique, uh, single lens photography. So you have a digital SLR, it has a lens on it, and you want to make 3D lenticular prints. So there's a few ways of doing that. You can either move your camera past the subject, or you can let your subject move past the camera. So the ca uh, camera moving past the subject, some examples of that would be putting your camera on a slider and just sliding across from left to right. Having your subject move past a stationary camera, you'll see some illustrations uh, coming up, but basically you could put your subject on a turntable and just let it rotate in front of a, a tripod mounted camera. So let's look at some of these things. So here's a picture of a, a rig I used uh, probably 10 years ago, but it's basically a, a simple linear slider that I was able to buy on Amazon for maybe $99 or $100 and mounted to it is a, a Canon digital SLR camera and basically I can put the camera in burst mode, slide it from one side to the other and capture a series of frames uh, until its buffer fills up. Uh, sliders, there are inexpensive ones and there are very expensive ones. So the left one is the uh, simple Amazon purchase slider, about $100. The Edelchrome Wing is a cool slider because it's very portable and will let you move your camera about uh, 15 inches linearly from left to right. And the Kessler slider is a little longer, it's probably about a meter or so, but it has a neat capability in that it can be set up to tow in the camera. So as you're sliding, it'll keep your your subject centered in the field of view, which is pretty nice. Some photographic suggestions. Put your camera into manual exposure mode and lock down the exposure and white balance. I used to lock down the focus as well, and for some subjects it's still advisable, but my latest camera is a Sony and it has what's called eye autofocus, where it'll lock in on eye and hold the focus. And so when I'm shooting people, I tend to use the eye autofocus, but lock down the other parameters. I always say take plenty of frames. It's better to have too many than too few. Uh, my general workflow had been to take uh, 10 to 40 frames, but some of the newer cameras have such great burst depth. I know my little po Sony point and shoot can do 70 frames, and the Sony A9 can do you know 150 or so frames. And I think the newer Canons are almost limitless. So all you have to do is hold on the button and slide that camera from left to right and take a burst of frames. Now, even though typically these days I'll take 70 frames, I don't use all 70 when I make the finished print. I'll probably use, you know, 20 to 40 frames, something, something like that. But we'll talk about that a little later. So best type of camera for this slide arrangement is one that has a fast frame rate, good burst depth, uh, high ISO is very beneficial. A lot of the work I do is in the studio and I want to have a shutter speed of a 1 250th or shorter so I can stop any motion blur from me moving the slider. And so in cases like that, I'll often use an ISO that might be 2,000 or 4,000 or, or even higher in some cases. And then I like cameras that have raw file support because it makes it so easy to adjust color balance and exposure and open up shadow detail after the fact. Uh, when you're doing photography, you want to use a wider than normal stereo base. So if you think of classic stereo photography where you have about two and a half inches between your two lenses or your frame, I've found through experience that to make a 3D lenticular print, I want three times to six times that base. And if I'm using an animation sheet, I want between six times and 12 times that two and a half inches. So in this case, you can see anything from as short as seven and a half inches to as long as 30 inches, depending on the type of sheet I'm using. Here's how I, I came up with that. I, I just make typically two size pictures, sort of a letter size picture, which is commonly about eight by eight or slightly smaller, or pictures for the wall, which are generally 16 by 16 inches. And depending on what type of sheet I'm using, they have different viewing angles. The 3D sheet has a 24 degree viewing angle. The animation sheet has a 48 degree angle. Now, usually prints are viewed from a, a certain viewing distance, which is generally between one and a half 
times and two times the diagonal of the print size. So on a letter size print, they're typically viewed from about 20 inches away, and on a wall print, they're typically viewed from about 40 inches away. But when I stand back from the prints at those distances, there's an angle that's made between my two eyes and the print. So in the case of the eight by eight print, the eye angle is about eight degrees, and in the 16 by 16, it's about four degrees. So what I do is I take the viewing angle of the sheet and divide it by the eye angle, and then I come up with these multiplication factors. So just looking at the chart, I'm going to assume we're going to either make a letter size print or a wall size print, and I'm assuming we're going to use a 3D sheet. And you can see for the small print, I need three times the normal uh, stereo base, and for the wall print, I need six times the normal stereo base. So I, I will say uh, <laughs> use it if you want to. This is how I... I do my work. I'm sure there are other methods of figuring out the, the correct base. All right, now we talk about other ways of moving your camera. Uh, here's two examples, a dolly or a drone. The dolly in this picture is called an orbital dolly. You can certainly set the wheels so you can move that in a linear fashion, but you can also adjust the wheels to have the dolly arc around your subject. I have found uh, two things. For most 3D pictures, moving the camera in a linear fashion works great. For portraits, linear does work great, but I love the orbit. There's something about the, the quality of the 3D portrait where you know it's just you're changing your perspective as you as you rotate this print in hand or walk by it, and it's very compelling. I I like it. It's probably just my personal taste, but if I had a choice. I'd always orbit. Um, however, for ease of use, almost all the time I'm using just a linear <laughs> track because the the orbital dolly, you know, there's a lot involved in, in setting that up and, and using it. And then there's the application of using a drone to do aerial footage. That works quite well. You'd basically just, again, either fly your drone past the building in a linear fashion or you orbit the building and collecting your series of frames. Now with the drones, people ask me, you know, should we take a series of still pictures? I generally don't recommend that. Most of these drones now have 4K video. Each frame of 4K video is the equivalent of eight megapixels, which is more than enough for these lenticular prints. So I would typically recommend someone wants to drone 3D lenticulars just to put the, uh, the drone into a video mode. Then there's turntable photography, which works great with stationary subjects, like you can see those two stuffed animals in the top picture. Doesn't work very well for human figures like this model standing on a motorized turntable. Uh, the turntable works great. Uh, people on the turntable have a tendency to let their body rotate, but to keep their head fixated on the camera, which is not what we want. You, you almost want the person to have a statue-like pose and not move at all. Now, something I stumbled on early on is this idea of using a rotating stool for portraits, which works really well. And I like it, especially if I have to travel and I don't want to, you know, bring along big sliders or the turntable or anything. You can have someone sit down on the stool and just rotate. And they don't have to rotate very far, maybe, you know, less than 15 degrees. The key with the rotational technique, though, is you need a solid background. You should either have like a white background or a black background. You don't want to have anything textured in the background or this rotational technique won't work. Then there's motion parallax. Uh, two examples here, one a train that was going by and I just panned the train with my camera, taking a series of pictures. I lined up all those pictures onto the number on the front side of the train, and then this aerial photo of Chicago. I was just in a commercial jet flying over the city. I had my little pointed shoot. I pointed it out the window, did a little HD video. I extracted 160 frames from that video, lined them all up on the top of one of the buildings, and came up with a terrific lenticular print where the clouds are just floating right off the surface. So technique number four is multi-lens photography. So that can be a single camera with multiple lenses like this Nimslow camera, or it can be a series of cameras that are all fired in synchronization. The Nimslow camera came out in the early 1980s. The company was in business for two or three years. The intent was you'd put in your roll of film, you'd send the film to Nimslow for processing, 
They would use special machinery to make a lenticular print. You would hold that print in your hand and you would see the world in three dimensions. Sounded terrific. Didn't work all that well. Uh, I look at these prints. I've had people look at the prints and say, wow, this is almost 3D. And that was the problem with the Nims Law. It just didn't really have the, the depth. But considering what they were trying to accomplish and how complicated mass producing lenticulars is, it was amazing. It was simply amazing. There's a genius in England named David Birder. He lives in the London area. And he knows probably more than anyone about the Nims Low, with the exception of maybe Nims and Low themselves. <laughs> Nim and Low were each uh, individuals involved in the creation of this camera. Anyway, David Birder was printing Nims Low pictures from the beginning. He saw some of the limitations, and so he came up with a camera he calls the Bird Low. He'd take these Nims Low cameras and cut them apart and reassemble them into multi-lens cameras. Some had eight lenses, some had 12. I think one even had perhaps 18 or 24. I'm not sure exactly on that last point, but this one that you view here certainly is a, a 12 lens arrangement. Uh, you find these on eBay from time to time. I've never had the desire to purchase one. I think they're fantastically cool looking, but I just can't imagine myself shooting and scanning all that film. So I've taken the approach of using multiple digital cameras. This was one of my early systems I was using these Canon point-and-shoots. I probably put this together, I don't know, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. So it would allow me to take uh, five exposures and I could use Adobe After Effects or other retiming software to create uh, in-between frames. So I could, for example, convert five frames into 30 frames. So this is an example of that. On the left column, you can see the five frames from the camera array and then on the right you see 24 of 30 frames that were generated by Adobe After Effects showing horizontal perspective viewpoints that are from virtual cameras that are in between the actual physical lenses. So that's a pretty cool technique for getting more views from a few views. All right now we enter the world of image processing. You have a frame series and now you have to do something with it. You want to make a lenticular print. So the first thing you have to do is pitch test your lenses and we'll talk about that in just a moment and then you want to process your frames by adjusting them if they need any color or geometrical correction, aligning the frames and then interlacing the frames. If you have anaglyph glasses you could put them on at this point and look at this uh, representation of this upcoming lenticular. <laughs> this was done with Power Illusion software. It allows me to take two frames from the series, put on my glasses, and look at the depth. And it's important to do that during the workflow because if you load your frames in the reverse order, you will end up with a pseudoscopic lenticular, which is not what you're after. So pitch testing the lens. All the software comes with the ability to make these pitch test patterns. They're basically alternating uh, black white lines or sometimes alternating color lines and you print out this pattern and then you bond the lenticular sheet to it and you view the sheet from the viewing distance that you would view the print from and again typically that's one and a half to two times the diagonal. So the top shows the print pattern, the bottom shows that pattern once the lens is mounted to it and you look for a line that turns solid black and when you rotate it solid white and that would be your correct pitch at that viewing distance. So in this case I ordered a 40 LPI lens from MicroLens and it tested out at 39.94 uh, LPI. And so that's a value you take note of because you're going to need that later when you use software to interlace your pictures. So digital image processing editing, uh, again, I usually shoot raw files, so I'll open them up in Adobe Camera Raw. I'll do any color balance that's required, an exposure adjustment. I often will uh, open up the shadows a little bit, and if any retouching is required, I can do that here, although I don't like doing retouching because if you have a series of 36 frames and you have to retouch a pimple out of 36 frames, it's a real pain, it takes a long time. So generally when I photograph people, I photograph them and get results that 
look as they were with <laughs> very uh, minimal or no retouching. And then geometric corrections uh, that can compensate for the skew or lens distortion. Uh, I'll generally use uh, Stereo Photo Maker to batch process the pictures and make those type of corrections. Then aligning, you have uh, to align all your pictures. Let's just say, for example, I was in the studio, I was photographing the model we saw in the last picture. So I had my tripod set up. There was a rail on top of the tripod. I had a camera on that rail that I could slide from slide to side to side. So I press down the shutter button and I slide the camera and maybe I take 70 pictures. Well, when I open up each of those pictures, the model's head is in a different position. And we don't want that for the purpose of making our lenticular print. So what we have to do is line up all those pictures relative to one another. So what I like to do is line everything up on the model's eye. I'll pick, typically pick a highlight in the eye and I'll line up everything to that. So that eye will be in the same XY position in all the frames. And that can be done in uh, Photoshop, it can be done in Stereo Photo Maker, it can be done in Adobe After Effects. If I have a small series of frames, I'll usually use Photoshop and I'll just call up a reticle onto the highlight in the eye and then I will uh, move the frame layers from frame to frame and adjust them that way. If I want to be more precise, I can use the uh, layer mode with a viewing option of difference and then that will basically make the screen look pretty much all black if they're lined up correctly and if they're not lined up you'll see edges. It's sort of hard to describe but it would be another technique that could be done in Photoshop. What I really like doing though is using Adobe After Effects with their tracker system. It basically allows me to look at the first image of the series. I can call up a little box and put it over the highlight in the eye. I can hit the play button and then it will track that position of the eye from one frame to the next. And when I'm all done, I can hit the uh, apply button and it will register all those frames together and then I can just export them out. So that's a terrific way to automatically align all those pictures very quickly without a lot of work on your part. So once they're all aligned, the next thing is to crop them to the desired print aspect ratio. So I generally make square pictures, so I crop everything to a square, but you could use you know, any aspect ratio you desire. So you align all the pictures, you crop them, and then you export them and save them for interlacing. So what interlacing is, it combines all the individual frames into a single file for printing. So here you can see on the left an interlaced view of the model. And if you look at it, there's no lens on it in this case. You know, where her eye is, it's nice and crisp. And when you see the, the hair, it's beginning to look a little softer. And that's because the, the hair is in a different uh, horizontal position each frame. And once we place the lens on that, that hair will actually protrude forward off the surface of the print. When you look at the right illustration, you can see these vertical bands or columns. Each one of those bands is the width of the individual lenticule that will be bounded to it. And then within each band is a pixel column or stripe from each of the individual frames. So that's how a lenticular print looks when you view it uh, from very close. All right, now you remember before we had a, a pitch value uh, that's derived from the pitch chart. So you take the value from the chart and you put it into your interlace box. So this is a mismatch set of frame grabs. So the top illustration still shows the 40 LPI pitch test chart. The bottom render setting, you can see I put in 60.1. That's the pitch value I derived when I did the pitch test chart on a 60 LPI lens. So basically you do that pitch test chart you come up with the uh, precise pitch for your viewing distance and you put that in the interlacing software. So once you load the frame set into the software, you'll do the 3D preview to make sure you're not pseudoscopic, that everything looks right. You'll input the uh, desired pitch. The software can also add registration lines around the border of your print and then you save that file and then you print that file. So this illustration here is a preview of an 18 frame slide bar series of this model. And then I grabbed uh, two frames, basically looking at one third of the distance, because you can remember I'm printing this on a 
uh, 3D lens, so I use that 3x multiplier factor. So pick those frames, look at it. If it has the right amount of depth, then I proceed. Printing and finishing. So we're getting close to the end. We take our Epson or Canon inkjet printer and we load it with uh, hopefully white film media and then we send our file to print. Your driver should be set at its highest quality mode. The Epsons have a finest detail input that I use and I also set the driver up to do unidirectional printing so the print head will print and it will return to the start point and it will print and return to the start and print versus bidirectional printing where the head prints going in each direction and your prints come out twice as fast. This probably is not a huge deal for small prints, but certainly when I'm making larger ones, there's more geometric accuracy when you print in the unidirectional method. Uh, people try to coax out the highest resolution they can get from their printer. Um, this is an illustration looking at some software called QImage. It's a PC-based program, and their claim to fame is that it can produce higher resolution from your inkjet printer. It certainly does produce cleaner resolution in both the 180, 360 pixel per inch uh, samples here. 720, it's different. I'm not so sure there's any practical benefit to it. A lot of the users, well, I should say some of the users on my lenticular form, use uh, RIPs, raster image processors, to send files to their printers. I've heard good things about the Fiery RIP. I haven't used it myself. I think it's F-I-E-R-Y. You could Google that if you're interested. For my uh, purposes, I found the standard F print driver to be perfectly suitable. I have tested RIPs over the years. It's not as though I haven't explored that. Uh, but whenever I view the output under the microscope, I just don't see you know, the benefit. Your mileage may vary. I know other people, you know, you know, swear by the rips. So alignment and laminating. You have to take your print and bond it to the lenticular sheet. So you can see me on the left looking at a print on the light box, and then on the right, we're actually putting that through the laminator. The uh, print in this illustration does have a, a border around it for using registration. I like to take the print and tape it to a light box and then I pull a thin band of the release liner off the lenticular sheet, or sometimes I even just cut a half inch of the release liner off the sheet, and then I align that lens to the print using the printed registration pattern. Um, most of the patterns work in a method where they have a series of, you know, lines, maybe black and white lines or red and white lines, and you rotate the lenticular sheet until you have a solid border all the way around the print, and then you're in registration. There are uh, some small differences from one software vendor to another, but that's the basic idea. It's a way of visually making sure that your particular lens is uh, centered and in registration. So anyway, then I, uh, I tack the print to the lens, and I run that through the uh, laminator roller. For finishing a display, uh, often I display these, especially the large ones I make, in a borderless fashion. I cut off the registration lines and just frame the picture edge to edge. For small ones, I like to put a window mat over the picture that uh, hides the registration lines. Uh, sometimes for 3D pictures, especially smaller ones, I'll use a shadow box frame, some dimensional matting, so I'll float the mat an inch or two off the surface. That just makes it look like a little diorama. It's kind of a neat look. And then in certain situations, I've experimented with light boxes. Now, I don't use them personally, but there are a lot of artists that love the look of a lenticular on a backlit light box. Uh, obviously, it requires electricity, and that's the principal reason I don't use it. I just like hanging these up on the wall, just like regular, regular photographs. So here's a few examples of framing styles I uh, have used in the past and, and some that I use currently. Top left, I actually made these lenticulars, uh, 3Ds of a plane and a train and, and also cars. So it's sort of a, a vehicle series I call plane, trains and automobiles. And then I actually used the uh, wide format inkjet printer to print this matte border that looked like giant slides. So anyone who was a traditional photographer and ever shot Kodachrome or Ektachrome, you would know your slides would come back in these two by two mounts. So what I did was I blew up 
those two by two mounts and uh, use them to frame the lenticular. Now I took a little artistic liberty. Normally, if the image is viewed right, that the print on the slide mount would be on the back side. But to me, I, I just love the graphic of the slide mount. So that's what I did there. And then on the top right, those are actually uh, three landscape lenticulars that I have made and sold. And they're mounted in shadow boxes. So you can see that box is probably two or three inches deep. The mats at the front surface, the lenticulars at the back surface, and it really adds to the 3D illusion. And then the bottom picture is a gallery exhibition I was doing, and you can see that lenticulars are just framed without any mat. They're, these are 16 by 16 prints, and I have the aluminum frame uh, right at the edge of those. So we're just about done. Where can you learn more? Well, there are you know online resources, some articles you can read, some books to look at. You can download sample software like the Triaxi software and go through their manuals. If you buy the 3D Easy Space software, they have just absolutely terrific documentation. It's been a while since I looked at it, but it's got to be 100 pages with all sorts of uh, photographic techniques. So uh, highly recommend it. I, I think it's worth buying the software just for the manual. Uh, if you don't want to make your own lenticulars, there are service providers that uh, do that. Um, again, you can... Google custom 3D uh, lenticular. I, I know one, there's a fellow in our group, Z-Axis Prints, uh, Harvey Jewett, he provides a service. He's out in the Northwest. But I think if you look under Z-Axis Prints through, in Google, you'll be able to find him. Uh, I've written a couple articles in the uh, Stereoscopy magazine put out by the International Stereoscopy Union. If you buy their back, you should use number 108. It talks about going from a stereo pair to a lenticular print. Issue 109 is desktop printing of 3D lenticulars. So it gives you a little more information on the process. And then there's a couple books. Uh, Itzik Weissman wrote this book a couple years ago, Lenticular Imaging Theory and Practice. It really allows you to have a deep understanding of the lenticular process. Now I have to concede it's not a how-to book. It's not going to tell you you know exactly how to photograph and and print these things in sort of a practical manner but from a theoretical perspective to understand the lenticular process and why you might want to photograph something in a certain way it's very valuable if you're someone who likes to do 3d modeling uh, with computer software and then make lenticular prints from that this would be a, a book of high high value so definitely if you're if you want to be a, a practitioner, it's a nice book to have, giving you the, the background. This Kim Timby book is really interesting. It's <laughs> This picture doesn't do it justice. It's, it's a fairly thick book, and it goes through the history of 3D and animated lenticular photography, largely from what I would consider to be a, a French perspective. But I find it fascinating because one of the key practitioners of 3D lenticular uh, around the World War II time frame, so let's say in the 1940s and 1950s, was uh, this fellow from France named Bonnet. And she goes to through extensive detail on his studio and, um, and some of his competitors who, who copied his techniques. And it's just really a fascinating read. And of course, that's just you know one chapter of it. She goes through much more than that, but it really is very interesting from a historical perspective. So online resources, I actually moderate a Facebook group called Lenticular Art and Artists, and people are free to join that. And we have, uh, I think right now, well, between 150 and 200 people from all over the world that uh, practice the lenticular technique. Uh, some are experts in it, some are world-renowned artists, and some are ranked beginners looking for help. Uh, but it's a great way to cross-pollinate some of the knowledge in this field. Uh, suppliers, you can look at these places online. If you're in Europe, DP Lenticular is a supplier of the plastic sheets. They have a lot of information on their website, uh, lenstar.org, uh, U.S. organization, sort of an outgrowth of Packer, which is a, a company in Wisconsin that makes uh, lenticular sheets primarily for for high volume printing, but they have some good online resources. Microlens.com, this company manufactures the thicker lenses that we like to use with inkjet printed lenticulars. 
Um, and I would also say, you know, give MicroLens a call. They're very helpful people. Uh, Triaxis, I, I kind of single them out. I, I don't know if it's fair or not, but they've just done so much to support the lenticular field over the, the past 10 years. They're always updating their software. Uh, Alexi, who is the principal person there, you know, is just really supportive of all, all his users. So they, they have a lot of information on their site. Uh, they have a software you can uh, download trial versions of and, and t test the whole workflow before you would you know, necessarily commit to, to buying anything. So with that, this is me, Michael Brown, Antioch, Illinois. There's my phone number, uh, a website, michaelbrown.com, a uh, business page on Facebook, Michael Brown Optical Art, Inc. I'm on Instagram at the Art of MJB and also at 3D Photo Art. At 3D Photo Art, I primarily just post stereo pairs, but I didn't want them clogging up my other Instagram <laughs> account because most, most of the public can't free view stereo pairs, but I know a lot of people that are probably watching this presentation can, and, and that's where I put my pairs. Um, also, every once in a while, if you're on Facebook, you can try to video chat with me if you have a particular question, always willing to do that. I hope this presentation has been of some value to you, and I thank you if you've made it this far. Take care.